I just realized, listening to Gary go through all that, this is a long chapter. <laughs> I'm going to preach on this whole thing. Um, but today, uh, we, we end our time in Acts for at least for see future. <clears throat> and I found this to be one of the most um, enlightening and, and rich of all the, the chapters we've gone through. And one of the things that I noted, that I took notice of, um, was how this book ends. It, it, it sort of leaves you in suspense, wondering what happens. And there's no small commentary on this. Scholars, theologians, and pastors alike have all wondered why does Luke simply end this? He, let me change my. This mic. We'll get it on? Okay, good. Sorry about that. He simply just ends this book without giving us any kind of indication of what happens to Paul. And there are those scholars that'll say that, uh, well, he intended to write another book or that he did write another book to Theophilus concerning these matters, and we just don't have an account of it. Um, but I think in my own conclusion that we arrive at that, that that's strange to us if we lose sight of the objective, if we lose sight of the protagonist in this entire narrative, we will lose sight of the actual purpose of it in realizing that this book isn't about Paul. It wasn't about Peter. It wasn't about John. There was an entirely other person, thing, in this entire narrative that this book was about. And if we look at it from that perspective, you'll see that this Luke, he ends this wonderfully. Amen? And so that's what I want to focus on today is we do this. Not only here in Scripture, but in life, when we simply lose sight of the objective, we lose sight of what is the meaning behind what is most important. We, we lose sight of, we, we, we lose all sense of direction. When we don't know where we're going, how do we know how to get there? How do we know if we're actually going there? And so today I want to answer some very important questions, probably the most significant questions that have ever been posed. What is the purpose what is our purpose? What is the meaning? What is the meaning of life? What is our objective? What is our purpose? Amen? Some rather significant questions to answer, but I, I, I believe I have the answer. I think. Uh, but last week, we, we were in chapter 27, and we, I, what I did was I paralleled, I gave us this parable of their time out on the sea with the church, all that they endeavored to do, all that they were trying to do to circumvent their peril. Uh, I contrasted that with the actions and the endeavors of a church. And, but in the, in, the, in the end, we saw how they were shipwrecked and ended up on this Isle of Malta. And so this is where we pick up in chapter 28 as they've all arrived safely on shore. And these islanders, these inhabitants of this island, they're showing them extraordinary kindness. And they decide to build them a fire, all 276 of them. This is a rather, rather large fire. And so we're in the midst of this. Paul, being the servant that he was, he decided to help. And all of the commotion, all of the, the warmth of this fire, perhaps this serpent, this viper, nestled in in these, this brush wood, uh, reached out and struck Paul on the hand and attached itself to him. And watch what happens as the, uh, the islanders, they, 
immediately they arrive at the conclusion that this man must be a murderer because given that he just escaped the sea, this peril at sea, justice, this deity justice would not suffer him to live another day. And now, I, this is controversial, mainly because of my perspective on it. And listening and reading all that the, all that theologians and, and, and commentaries they've had to say about this, we arrived at two completely different conclusions. And typically when this happens, when I have a, arrive at a conclusion uh, and I can't find any evidence, anyone supporting that, I'll abandon it. Um, but I, I'm going to stand firm on this today. And so they can just, or you can label me a heretic, burn me at the stake, but I'm going to speak my truth this morning. Uh, Many of these commentaries, all these theologians, they, 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 they point out that these villagers, these islanders, they incorrectly arrive at this conclusion that Paul was indeed a murderer. They say that they didn't know who this man was. They, they build a context and saying, well, you, this shows that you not judge a book by its cover. And they say, this was the apostle Paul. This was this great man. He was this finely tuned instrument of God. True, but then on the other hand, what I said was they were right. They were right. This man was a murderer. He, at least by my assessment, he says it in Acts 26, verse 10. He says, on the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against him. He was complicit in the murdering of innocent Christians. He had his hand in that. Even by biblical standards, by today's standards, we would label him a murderer. He had it in his heart. It was his desire to have these people put to death. And so I said, well, no, they arrived at a, a rightful conclusion that yes, he deserved to die. And that is what it is. But when we lose sight of the objective, when we lose sight of the main character in this narrative, we can't see what just happened here. Look what Luke, what, sorry, what Mark says. What, what, what Christ said in, in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. If you have your Bibles, go there. Mark chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. He says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. This is Jesus speaking. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Do we see that? This was prophecy. This was what Christ said would happen. When those believed in me and they were baptized in my name, in my name, they would do these things. These were signs. And so when we focus in on the individual, we lose sight of the, the bigger picture here. This wasn't to say that, and, and I want to say this, as my, I want to be definitive and clear on this. Do not, do not go out and pick up a snake. <laughs> do not drink poison. Do not go out to try to lay your hands on people, heal them, and, and cast out demons. And this is why. This is what, look what Christ says here. These are signs. They are not endeavors. We don't endeavor to go and pick up snakes and drink poison. These are signs of a condition in Christ. As we have placed our faith in Christ and have been baptized in his name, these are signs and symptoms of that condition. If you have a cold, you don't endeavor to demonstrate the symptoms. You don't say, well, I have a cold, so I need to go and show the world that by sneezing, 
I'm going to make myself sneeze so everyone will know I have a cold. Don't do that, especially not now. If you sneeze in public, you, you, you will be on an island. <laughs> I don't know if you've done this, you may just, something may have been in the air, it just tickled your nose and you, you, you dare not sneeze right now during all of this going on. But these are symptoms. They are not endeavors. And they are for a purpose. For the main purpose of what Paul is doing here, it's not about him. These signs and symptoms are to demonstrate his condition to bring about this purpose, this objective, the main objective in this narrative. Do we see that? No, we don't. Not yet. We'll get there. But that tells us one thing. One thing we can grasp from this is that if you place your faith in Christ, if you are calling yourself a Christian, there ought to be some signs and symptoms in your life. There ought to be not an endeavor, not saying that I need to do this and I need to do that to show everyone that I'm a Christian, but it ought to be some symptoms. There ought to be some signs that you are a believer in Christ for the grander purpose, not for you, not so you can say, hey, do you see me? Did you see me doing that? Do, did, did you see me cast out those demons? Did you see me lay hands on those sick people? Did you see me doing that? I did that. That's not what we're doing. There is a greater objective, a greater principle to what we are doing here. We are simply showing signs and symptoms to elucidate, to, to bring about this greater purpose. Amen? And this is what's happening here in this text. Look as... They've spent three, three, three months on this island, and they're about to set out to sea. And this is funny because there was another ship there. There was an Alexandrian ship there that had taken up their port there and rested there for the winter. Now, mind you, uh, when they were out at sea, Paul, when they were off the shore of Crete, Paul wanted to stop at Fair Havens. The... Centurion and the ship owner and the captain, they wanted to go up to Phoenix, about 40 miles to the west, to the northwest. And so understand that this Malta was perhaps a regular port of call on this journey from uh, Alexandria to Egypt. They would stop there perhaps regularly. Now watch what happens as they went up the coast no one wanting, thinking about going to Malta. They got caught in this wind, which drew them, blew them about 600 miles off course to this destination. Do we see that? No one was thinking about Malta. No one was talking about Malta. No one had any plan that we are aware of in this text that they were going to Malta. But if we see the bigger objective here, if we know the, the main character of this narrative, we'll see that he had different, uh, a different itinerary, a different agenda. And I, I, I can say that with confidence because, you know, even though that there's no indication that Paul preached the gospel on the, in this, this narrative, Luke does not write anything about him preaching. If we look back today, if we look today at the demographics of their religious affiliation on this island, 98 to 100 percent of the inhabitants of this island identify as Christian. 98 to 100 percent identify as Christian. The word was preached on that island. Somehow, some way, there was another agenda. There was a purpose to be fulfilled on this island. Amen. Watch as they've made their way up the coast. In verse 14, it says, as they set out and began walking to these various towns, it says in verse 14, there we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters we had there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as 
the forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Do we see that? Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Now, if you're just looking at Paul, then this really just says, yeah, okay, he was encouraged by the people that he saw there. These brothers and sisters. Mind you that he never probably been to Rome. He doesn't know these people here. He wasn't the one that founded the church in Rome. As a matter of fact, he had written a letter to them before he had ever come there. And now look, this is, this is what is just brilliant about this. If we go to Romans, chapter 1, verse 10. This is his prayer, what he's saying to the Romans. This church there, he says, In my prayers at all times... And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Do we see that? Look what he says. He says, when what Luke writes, he says, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. This wasn't by chance. This wasn't by happenstance. This was divine providence. There was another character. That the main character in this narrative was working, setting this into course. This was a prayer being answered that this man so fervently prayed, and not simply just so he could have a warm and fuzzy feeling. Thank you. I get to see you, and we get to shake hands and have tea and, and whatnot, this was for encouragement, for the road, for the objective that lay ahead. And this gives us tremendous insight in how we are to pray. As Christ says, you pray in my name. Whatever you pray in my name and ask the Father of me, I will give to you. He will give to you. This name, this praying in the name, this purpose, the function, we see that Paul was praying with the purpose to encourage one another for the journey that lie ahead, to accomplish this objective, praying in the purpose. We don't, it's, it's like you've been given a task at work and, and, and they say you got to go to this country here and you need to set up uh, relations with this company. Well, the first thing you do, you'll calculate, you'll Surmise all that you may need for the journey that lies ahead. I'm going to need to book a flight. I'll need to uh, book a hotel room, uh, uh, whatever. And you ask your boss, hey, I need this to accomplish the mission. This is how we pray. But it is imperative that we understand the objective. We cannot pray in accordance with the will of God if we don't understand the objective. We have to keep sight of the objective. Amen. As Paul, he finally reaches Rome, he calls, as he typically does, he, he'll call the, the local and leading Jews of that area, the synagogues, and he's sort of going to explain to them why he is here in chains. And he says, look, this is the reason why. I did nothing wrong. It's simply because of what I believe. What the prophets have said to us and what I, I, I simply believe what I've been taught to believe. And they say that, well, look, uh, we don't know what you're talking about. We have no idea. We haven't received any letter from Judea or Jerusalem. Uh, but what we would like to know is, what about these Christians? This sect, there's all sort of ill report of them. We'd like to know your thoughts on these people. And so they set up a time that they would all come together and meet. In verse 23, it says, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through the Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. 
For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. This is a, a, a sort of reoccurring narrative in that there's a res, an intended recipient of this blessing that they reject it, and it is passed on to these Gentiles. We see this throughout the Gospels. We see this in the parable of the, the wedding, the parable of the, the vineyard. These, the, the intended recipients rejecting the gift of God only to spread to those that uh, otherwise it wasn't intended for in the beginning. But we think about what this entails. Bringing as God intended to bring all people together through his word. This was the intention. This was the objective. And we see that this was written before time, before this time it even began. And what we need to understand about this in that why I think so many people scratch their heads at the way this narrative ends is because they don't realize this isn't about Luke. This is about the kingdom of God. This is about salvation through Jesus Christ, through the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is what this entire book is about. This whole narrative, Paul is simply the instrument that God is wielding in all that he did, demonstrating the kingdom of God was at hand. That's what it's about. And look how Luke ends it. He says, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, knowing that all boldness, going back to when he was on the Isle of Cyprus, emboldened by the Spirit, rebuking that bar Jesus, false prophet. This is not about Paul. It's about the kingdom of God. It is about salvation through Jesus Christ. It is about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is who is at work in this entire narrative. That is who it's about. And if we end it with that perspective, we see that there is no question as to what happens. If we want to know what happens to the kingdom of God and the salvation through Jesus Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we simply look around us. We simply look at where we're at today and how this kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There is no mystery. It's right before our very eyes. But when we lose sight of the objective, when we hear all of this, listen to all of this background noise and we get sidetracked, we lose sight of the protagonist, focusing, focusing in on the deuteragonist, the secondary characters in this narrative, in life, when we lose sight of the kingdom of God, we lose sight of direction. If that is where we're headed, then how do we know to get there if we don't know that that is where we're headed? If we're focused on something else, then how do we know if we're headed in the right direction? Revelation 21.1, it tells us, John speaking, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from every eye. There will be no more death, no mourning, crying, or pain, for the older things has passed away. When we get sidetracked into the, these things that are not focused on the kingdom of God, understand that they are going to pass away. When we focus on what's going on right now, especially now, 
We are focused on, on oh, well, well, the Republicans this and the Democrats this and this COVID-19 this and all the riots and all of this. Understand that these are indications of the kingdom of God at hand. This must pass away. Why on earth are we clinging to what is going to perish when the hope and our promise is in the kingdom of God? When we see this deteriorating before our very eyes, we ought not be weary, we ought not worry. It is written, this will come to pass. It will pass away. There will come a time where we will be with our God, he will be with us, and none of this will happen again. The old things will pass away. Somebody ought to give God the glory right now in this place. This must pass away. But when we lose sight of the objective, when we forget that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, when that, all that is happening right now is thrusting us, propelling us forward towards this eschatological discourse, this very end, the coming of the Messiah, the second, the kingdom of God, this new Jerusalem dressed in great beauty standing before us. Amen. This is what is written. This is the promise. We mustn't lose sight of the objective. This isn't about you. It's not about me. It's not about Inslee's edict. It's not about building a better America together. It's not about unity over division. It's not about making America great again. This is about the kingdom of God. This will pass away. It will not endure. That is the promise. May we maintain our perspective and looking to the objective. Everything that we do, the signs, the wonders, the symptoms, it is to bring about, to lay the foundation, to pave the way for the coming of the new kingdom, the coming of the new era. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. Father, I pray that this, your word, it fall not on deaf ears. Lord, open our hearts that we would know and see what you are doing in our midst. May we not be confused. You've given us direction. You've given us wisdom. You've given us your word that lays out the game plan from beginning to end. Why are we so confused? Why are we so worried? Why are we bothered when the promise is upon us? Father, may we refocus our attention to you. May we turn now to your kingdom. May we humble ourselves, repent in seeking your hand in our lives to show our signs and symptoms of the condition that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. We glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.